Well, good morning, family. Uh, my name is Lo Alleman. I am excited to be sharing with y'all in worship today and excited that I get to share the word. Um, I want to give you guys a quick heads up and almost a bit of a warning. We have some work to do today. We're going to be in Acts chapter 16. going to read about 23 verses in and of itself, which is a lot. Definitely going to be much more of a teaching time than a preaching time, but I want to start off with a time of just encouragement to let you know there is a word from the Lord for you today, wherever you are. The prophet Isaiah says, how beautiful on the mountain are the feet of those that bring the good news. I have to tell you, I personally don't like feet, think they're pretty weird looking and kind of nasty. I think that if you are wearing open-toed shoes or even worse, barefoot, you should be arrested for public indecency because you are naked from the ankle down and it makes me uncomfortable. I'm not for the showing of the feet. Uh, I think Chaco should be burned, but I do understand. I understand what the prophet Isaiah is saying, how beautiful of a gift it is that the goodness of God, the grace of God, the love of God, his favor, his promise, his blessing is not a thing that we have to chase, but it runs toward us. How beautiful of a thing is it to see the goodness of God running after us. Wherever you are, friends, God's love, his heart, his desire for you is chasing you down. So we pray, Abba, that you would use this time, use our space together, use your word to inspire us, to show us your goodness as we get to work in this thing. It's in your name we pray. Amen. Uh, We are actually wrapping up our uh, sermon series, Contagious Faith, and Faith Goes Viral. We're ending this journey through the book of Acts, and we've we've seen a dynamic play out through the book of Acts, that God is doing a beautiful thing through the work of Jesus, through the the cross. God is reconciling us vertically to God. But there's a dynamic that you can observe that every time Jesus meets someone, every time a spirit moves in somebody's heart to see how God is reconciling things vertically, there's an impact horizontally, faith is becoming contagious. And not just a vertical faith, a horizontal one. It's a dynamic one. I kind of put it on the screen for you guys to see. Vertical faith is believing that God is forgiving sin, is defeating sin. But horizontal faith is observed as well. That we see that God is freeing us from sin and setting to right all the things that sin made wrong. God is not just reconciling us to himself, which he is doing, but he's also reconciling the church to the world. That something is happening vertically. Our hearts are becoming one with the Father. Christ is removing the chasm. There's no separation between us and the goodness of the Father, which is beautiful. But as he's doing that, he's also changing lives. That our world is becoming directly impacted by this spreading of the good news. Lives like Paul's are being turned around. People who are once enemies of God are finding themselves championing and heralding this message and devoting their lives to the faith. In the Old Testament, sin broke apart language. You find that God is bringing language back together, symbolic of how he's bringing people back together. Jews are doing doing life with Gentiles. It's a beautiful story how God is reconciling things vertical, but also horizontal. Heaven is messing with earth. It's doing things in our world. And as we continue in the story of Acts chapter 16, we'll see it keeps happening. We're going to read a good chunk of verses, verse 11 to 34. And make sense of it as we go. So a little context. Uh, Paul and his friends were about to go to a place, and the Spirit told them not to. Spirit's messing with their plans, messing with their direction. They want to go and take the gospel. And instead, he leads them to a place here. So far in verse 11. From Troas, we put out to sea and sailed straight for Samothrace. And the next day, we went to Neapolis. From there, we traveled to Philippi, a Roman colony, and the leading city of that district of Macedonia. And we stayed there several days. On the Sabbath, we went outside the city gate to the river where we expected to find a place of prayer. They're looking for a place of prayer because this is a a pagan town and there is not a synagogue there. For there to be a synagogue, all you need is for 10 guys to show up, 10 Jews, to say, we want to have a synagogue here. And unfortunately, they could not find 10 dudes. So instead, they go and find the sisters. Next verse is, we sat down and began to speak to the women who had gathered there. One of those listening was a woman from the city of Thyatira named Lydia, a dealer in purple cloth. She was a worshiper of Yahweh. The Lord opened her heart to respond to Paul's message. When she and the members of her household were baptized, she invited us to her home. If you consider me a believer in the Lord, she said, come and stay at my house. Lydia is a dealer in purple fabric. Purple was a rare dye made from shellfish, and it was really, really expensive, high-end fabric. She sold it to very uh, affluent people. Um, So baby girl was pretty much loaded, had a lot of money, was well off. And you would think she would be content given her lot. 
She has a lot of money, owns her own business. She's hanging out with the girls. She don't need no man. Like she's doing great by all standards. But it says that the Lord opened her heart to, the, to Paul's message, realizing that there's more to life than just the success. There's more to life than this affluence. There's more to life than all that I'm receiving. Her heart is open to the gospel and it wraps around it. And something happens to her vertically. Her heart is committed to Jesus, but, but something also happens horizontally. Do you see it? She says, hey, if you guys believe that I'm a believer, I don't just want to see you guys when we get to heaven. Come stay at my house now. Come do life with me. She responds in hospitality and generosity. Something happens horizontally as well. Put her words in another frame. She says, if you believe that your father is my father, then you have to call my house your home. Let's do life together. Let's share our resources. Let's be in community with one another. And as we keep reading, this keeps happening. Once, when we were going to the place of prayer, we were met by a female slave who had a spirit by which she predicted the future. She earned a great deal of money for her owners by fortune telling. She followed Paul and the rest of us shouting, these men are servants of the most high God who are telling you the way to be saved. She kept this up for many days. Finally, Paul became so annoyed, do not miss the interesting motivation for ministry here. He was so annoyed, but he turned around and said to the spirit, in the name of Jesus Christ, I command you, come out of her. At that moment, the spirit left her. When she, her owners realized that their hope of making money was gone, they seized Paul and Silas and dragged them into the marketplace to face the authorities. They brought them before the magistrates and said, these men are Jews. They're throwing our city into an uproar by advocating customs unlawful for us Romans to accept or practice. The crowd joined in the attack of Paul and Silas. The magistrates ordered them to be stripped and beaten with rods, public shaming, which was illegal to do to another Roman citizen. After they had been severely flogged, they were thrown into prison, and the jailer was commanded to guard them carefully. When he received these orders, he put them in the inner cell and fastened their feet to the stocks. Not a great start for our guys. Like, can you see them? They're expecting to go and take this gospel and expecting a horizontal reaction, an impact horizontally. And there is a reaction, but it's not necessarily the one they wanted. And this idea that, that the gospel will do things in our world is true, but it doesn't always do things that we want it to do. Jesus says it this way, I have not, come to, I have not just come to bring peace to the world, but a sword to cause tension and frustration for those who are oppressing people, for those who are using the human body for economy, for those who are, are, are benefiting from the enslavement and the spiritual corruption of the day, they're not going to receive this message well. There's going to be some tension, some pushback between our world and the kingdom. And it's actually a good thing here. And you would expect our guys to be frustrated, to be discouraged, but the next line reads, about midnight, Paul and Silas were praying and singing hymns to God because they're just gangster like that. This is what they do. Like, like worship is deeply embedded in their bones at their core. When they're squeezed, only praise and worship can come out. You ever stub your toe in the middle of the night? Do you sing Hillsong? Like Chris Tomlin? That's not what comes out of us. But something has happened in their hearts that the inside, their inner workings, their inner dwelling, their core only knows worship. And apparently they're singing very loudly because other folks can hear them. Keep reading. The other prisoners were listening to them. Suddenly there was a violent earthquake. The foundation of the prisons were shaken. At once all the prison doors flew open and everyone's chains came loose. I wish I had time to preach that this morning. But the freedom that God wants to bring to us does not just impact us. That the hope that God wants to bring to you does not just impact you. They are in a very dark season of life. But they're exactly where they need to be for light to shine the brightest and to become contagious. The dark season you may be in, the uncertain time you may find yourself in right now, friends. Maybe you are exactly where you need to be for light to be contagious, for freedom to be contagious, for faith to be contagious. I got to read. Here we go. The jailer. He woke up, and when he saw the prison's doors were open, he drew his sword and was about to kill himself because he thought the prisoners had escaped. But Paul shouted, don't harm yourself. We are all here. The jailer called for lights, rushed in, fell trembling before Paul and Silas. He then brought them out and asked, sirs, what must I do to be saved? Which is words that we should all long to hear. They replied, believe in the Lord Jesus, and you will be saved, you and your whole household. And they spoke the word of the Lord to him and the others in his house. At that hour of the night, the jailer took them, washed their wounds. Immediately, he and all of his household were baptized. The jailer brought them into the house, set a meal before them, was filled with joy because he had come to believe in God, he and his entire household. We have to stop there because I haven't even mentioned a point yet. But come on. 
like, like moment after moment, scene after scene, the power of God almost leaping off the pages at us. God has done a thing vertically. No more chasm, no more veil. Our hearts are being reconciled to the Father. And our world has to follow suit. It's changing things around them. Everything is changed between us and God, so everything has to change in this world that we live in. Which is a powerful thing that we have to address in our context. We are all for the separation of church and state. But contagious faith does not give us an option to separate church and community. This isn't there. I'll say it again, just make sure it drives the point home. We can be for the separation of church and state. We don't want them messing with our business. But contagious faith means that vertical things have happened between us and God. And so horizontal implication has to be made relevant, has to be a sign, a result of what God is doing in our hearts, is that the world changes too. In the text, their cities are changed by the gospel. I believe the gospel wants to change our cities as well, amen? In the text, their prison systems are changed by the gospel. I believe it wants to change ours as well. Their economy is changed. Their houses are changed. Their family dynamics are changed. The gospel is not just reconciling us to the Father, but the world to the church. And this is something that is beautiful and powerful, but I think often missed in our culture. Within our context, we like there to be a separation. The way that we see things, we like there to be a separation between the sacred and the secular. And that doesn't seem to be a thing in the book of Acts or much of Scripture at all. In fact, depending upon how you read Scripture, depending upon your worldview and the framework with which you understand the gospel, the whole book of Acts may be really confusing. And so for a moment, I just want to address some of the ways that we think about the world. What are our worldviews? I think there are three main ways that we can see the world, three options, if you will. And these options were, are kind of boring to explain, and so I asked my wife uh, to help me draw some pictures. I draw terribly, um, but she's going to help me draw some pictures to kind of help us see, get a visual for what this looks like. So option one, option one I would call the container. And the container is all these really cute pictures that my wife drew. In the container is the material world. The way that we think about the world is it's all the things that we can touch and see and taste and hear and taste. The material world is all that there is. Everything that exists exists inside this box. So trees are in the box. The sun is in the box. Chick-fil-A is in the box. Praise God for that. Uh, good and evil is in the box. People are in the box. Love, hate, life, death, all exists within the box. And this idea is that everything that exists is here, and there's no hope outside of it. There is no existence beyond this life. There's no existence beyond the material. And a lot of atheists think this way. A lot of agnostics think this way. But a lot of religious folks think this way as well, that the only world we occupy is this one. The only way we exist is physically, in the way in which our material world responds together. And the box is not all bad, I and mean, there's good stuff. Everybody loves the sun and trees and Chick-fil-A. Like, all that's fine, but there's some issues with thinking about the world this way. One is that the box is, is full of good stuff, and so if you want, you can observe all the good things that are there, but there's some broken pieces in the box that we kind of can't avoid. If there's no world outside of this one, and there's no hope outside of this one, we have to rub shoulders with the good of the world and the bad of the world. The century that brought us the eyeglasses and opened people's eyes, the same century that brought us guns and started closing them forever, we discovered new lands historically, but historically we didn't treat the inhabitants well. And if we want to say that's all in the past and that's just the old world, we can look at our world. Even with globalization and capitalism, our world has some good stuff to it. We have space travel. We have modern medicine. We have Starbucks, all of which are amazing advances. We also have COVID-19. We also have racial tension. We also have human trafficking. We have brokenness in our box as well. And for a lot of us, this season has been a reminder that the box isn't perfect. We may have thought that was all the path that they dealt with the brokenness of the world, but we've arrived at utopia. And I think this hard season has reminded us that the physical world in and of itself has brokenness. And the issues that we face is that there's goodness and brokenness, not just in the world, but in our hearts as well. That even if we have all the good things in the box, we find ourselves dissatisfied, discontent, frustrated, longing for more. And if we try to fix the box, which is the most moral thing to do, the most selfish thing to do is just to enjoy the good things of the box, no matter who you oppress or hurt or marginalize in the process. But if you want to take the moral route, the best thing you can do is clean up the box. But the issue is the brokenness is not just out there. It's in all of us as well. Worst part of the box, 
Worst part of looking at the world this way is that it is void of hope and meaning. Ecclesiastes said it this way, vanity amongst vanity, meaningless amongst meaningless. The Hebrew word there is hevel. The whole world is made of smoke. There's no meaning we can grab hold to. We can see it. We can long for it, but we can't find meaning. We can't find purpose because everything that exists will exist no longer soon. Everything in the box has an expiration date. We won't last long enough to see the goodness of our works. We're darned if we do, we're darned if we don't. And the box is a really good way to depress yourself. And it's not just the, the atheists or the agnostics that think this way, but most politics leans this way. Clean up the box. Fix the box. The problem is them, not you. And the issue is, it's, it's, it's a half-truth. There's issues in our world, but there's also issues in our hearts. The box is depressing, but there's another option for us. Option two may be a bit more encouraging, and I think fits more well within the framework of how Christians think. And this one is the option of either or. The idea is that we still have our space. There's a box of sorts. Trees there, sun's there, cool looking dude's there. He has elf ears. It's cute, babe. But there's sin and death in our space. There's brokenness in our space. And luckily, there is more than just our existence. There's God's space. And God's space is full of his throne, which here looks like a lazy boy, which is cool. And there's angel babies with wings. You ever notice that angels are always like playing the harp? And they're like fat. And in our depictions of them in scripture they don't seem to look that way. But the idea is that God's space is better. Our space is filled with brokenness and God's space lives with his rule. We rule brokenly. He rules perfect. Our depictions of God who's an older dude, Gandalf if you grew up in a white space, what he kind of looks like. Morgan Freeman, if you grew up in a black space, he's an older, seasoned, wise guy who's inviting us to a life where he rules and he reigns, and all that's good. There's a bridge, though. There's a chasm between us, and there has to be a bridge to get us. Something separates our space from God's space. It's sin. It's brokenness. He's holy, and we are not. How do we get there? And that bridge, the Sunday school answer you all know, it's Jesus. Jesus comes to be a bridge between our broken world and God's world. And this perspective, I think, offers some truth but I think it's a half-truth. I think it's missing a couple of nuances. The main one, the main issue with this idea is, is Jesus. Jesus does weird things, like breaks bread, which is in our space, and calls it his body, which is sacred and holy in God's space. Jesus tells us to pray, which if the only purpose of Jesus is to get a ticket into heaven, then what's the point in praying? Why would God mess with our space if I'm supposed to just go to his space? The biggest issue I see with all of this is the motivation for getting to heaven. I grew up in a black church. Uh, we typically worship on Sunday for about six and a half hours. It's a long experience. And all the depictions we get of heaven is that there's cute chubby babies playing the harp and Morgan Freeman's there. And it's going to be a great time, but it's all worship all the time forever. Do you know how long forever is? It's a long time. I love worship. I love singing. But forever? It's a lot, it's a lot of time. And the motivator is not, okay, well, you really love singing, or you really love Morgan Freeman, or you really love angel babies who, who sell you toilet paper. Your motivation is if you don't go here, then you could go here. And this is hell. And this dynamic that we're preached often, every youth group I went to growing up, I heard, if you die tonight, where would you go, heaven or hell? It's the, it's the main narrative of this way of thinking, heaven or hell. Hell is this hot place like Mississippi in the summer. There's a devil there poking you with a fork. It smells like fart. It's a not great place. You don't want to be there. Which makes heaven seem like, okay, cool. I'll, I'll sing forever. I don't want to go there. But is that the motivation? To be with God forever? Is it just that we don't, we avoid hell? Really interesting. If you look up, you go on the internet or you look up on your Bible app, type in heaven and hell, or heaven or hell. You know how many times that shows up in scripture? It's a crazy amount. A whopping zero. This dynamic doesn't exist anywhere within Scripture, but it's a story we're told. It's a framework we have for looking at the world. Heaven and hell are not a narrative that show up at all in Scripture. It's not seen there. I think this image holds some truths, but it's a half-truth. And there's another option for us. The option I think that is the kingdom, the option I think makes the most sense. And that's this. It's the kingdom. It's our space, which is good and bad. Chick-fil-A and sin. Trees and brokenness. There's God's throne. It's where he rules and where he reigns. And the gap that bridges them together, not gets us to one other place, but bridges them together is Jesus. And what happens in scripture is this dynamic of heaven and earth is seen all the time. 
In fact, two-thirds of the Bible has this narrative in it. Of the 66 books, 42 chapters talk about heaven and earth as a dynamic. And that God makes heaven and earth, and he rules both of them, and his desire is to reunite them, to bring them both together. And in this space, Jesus makes a lot of sense. In this space, he is fully God, but he's fully man, together. In this space, Scripture makes sense. It's inspired by God. 2 Timothy chapter 3, all Scripture is breathed by God, inspired by God. But in chapter 4, Paul says, bring my jacket. It's written by humans, but it's both. God-inspired, influencing humans to write it. It's, it's a story that pulls them both together. And this is seen thematically through Scripture. The Garden of Eden, it's our space, but God dwells in it. He rules in it. God meets Moses at a burning bush and says, hey, take off your shoes. This is holy ground. I have reclaimed and repurposed this earth. I dwell here. And the Israelites, as they're traveling to a promised land, they begin to make these tabernacles, a place for God to dwell. It's where God's dwelling, his presence personally lives. They call it a tabernacle, a dwelling place. And in John chapter 1, Jesus is that same exact thing. It says he makes his dwelling among us, which is the same word for tabernacle. He tabernacles with us. It's God fully in our space fully. The vertical is interacting with the horizontal. That's what happens with the church, Ephesians chapter 2. The very last verse says that your body will be brought together. All of you will make a community together where the Holy Spirit will dwell or tabernacle, will live here. The kingdom is not about us escaping into heaven. The kingdom is about invading earth. And issues and politics and all that weird stuff that we like to argue about in the box doesn't seem to be the thing for Jesus. I heard a quote this week. It said, Jesus didn't come to take sides. He came to take over. He came to invade, to bring heaven here. That's what he tells us to pray. He didn't say the kingdom is far off, but it's near and it's coming. It's advancing. He says, pray, Father, your kingdom come. Not me go to it. Your kingdom come. Your will be done so that on earth starts to look like heaven, invade this space. And when we think about the world this way, the book of Acts, particularly verse chapter 16, start to make a lot of sense. Think about Lydia's story. If Lydia believed in the box, if her perspective was the box, she would have been content. She had the best that the world had to offer. She was successful. She was affluent, but she had a hole in her heart. God opens that and says, there's more to life than this. If she believed in option two, she would have just said, all right, fine. Uh, thanks, guys. I appreciate the Jesus ticket into heaven. But you know how we cash in that ticket into heaven in option two? It's by dying. In Scripture, death is not access to God. Death is a defeated foe that cannot keep us from heaven. She says, I won't just see you guys on the other side of this thing. She says, come, tabernacle with me. Make my house your home. Let's do life together. Let God create something here. In Celtic theology, the way that they think about God moving in our space, they call it thin spaces. Spaces where the veil between our space and God's space gets really thin, and you can't tell which space you're occupying. Is it my space or God's? I don't know. We're all meshed together. There's reunion. God is making a thin space, and that's what Lydia wants. Come and meet in my home. Gather in my home. Same thing happens with the girl. They see her broken. They see that she's a slave, and if all they cared about was the box, they would say, okay, she's a tool of capitalism. She's a slave. We should probably free that. But that's not the issue they address. They address her soul. They offer freedom by casting out the dark spirit. Her proclamation was correct. These guys are telling you the way of life. Her proclamation was right, but the spirit that needed to fill her was the Holy Spirit. They cast out the darkness. And before we think that they just left her on her own and said, all right, you deal with the problems of your life yourself, you notice how, how they're beaten and she's not. They lose this opportunity to make money off of her, and they beat Paul and Silas. All the energy goes to them. Now, at the end of this chapter, Paul and Silas say, hey, guys, you know, we're, we're Roman citizens. You kind of can't beat us, so come and escort us out of the prison. Had they spoken up then, all that energy would have gone to her. The jailer knew this. The jailer said, hey, I, I failed at my job. I'm going to take a sword and kill myself. There's no, there's, there's no mercy for, for failing at your job. But Paul and Silas take the beating. It mirrors Christ taking on our pain, not just removing sin, but the curse of it, the consequences for it, the pain that it's caused. They take the beating in our place. The jailer is one of my favorite examples of this. If he believed in the box, if the box was a perspective that met the jailer, then his life would have been meaningless anyway, and the blade would have been salvation. It would have been an escape from the container, an escape from his failure, and all the ways in which he got it wrong and messed up. If the box was his perspective, he would have been seen as an enemy. And there's no reason to save his life. But they speak up, they say, hey, we're here. And they offer him hope. They share the gospel with him. 
they invite him to do life together. And, and what happens next? Not just vertical reconciliation, but horizontal. He takes them into his home. He feeds them. He cleans their wounds. Why? Because they matter. Because our bodies matter. When Jesus comes back, he doesn't come back as a ghost. He comes back with a body, an earthly thing. Because the vertical, the vertical has set right the horizontal. The gospel is shaking things. It's changing stuff. And it's inviting us to respond as well. And what he says is, hey, come spend time in my house. Come hang out. The same thing Lydia said, hey, if your father's my father, call my house your home. They make a thin space, a tabernacle, out of his living room. They hang out together. And this doesn't just happen there. This happens all throughout the New Testament. The early church was a movement that bounced not just from city to city, continent to continent, but it starts in the home. Romans chapter 16, verse 5. Paul says, greet also the church that meets at their what? Their house. Colossians chapter 4, verse 15. says, give my greetings to the brothers and sisters of Laodicea and to Nympha and the church that meets where? At her house. Philemon, verses 1 and 2. Paul, a prisoner of Christ, and Timothy, our brother, to Philemon, our dear friend and fellow worker, also to Aphia, our sister, and Archippus, our fellow soldier, and the church that meets where? In their home. Their home is being reclaimed, repurposed. It's their space, but God is dwelling in it. And it becomes a thin space, a hollowed ground where God starts to do a work. Heaven starts messing with earth. They do business together, and something special happens. Hearts become converted. Lives become changed. And cities are impacted in the wake. Countries, continents, generations, history is impacted in the wake. Because somebody opened their door. What I love about my job is that I get to chase after this thing here in this church, that I get to work with home groups. And Harvest is a beautiful worship community. And what would it look like for us to take what the Spirit is doing in here and to not let it stop at our doors, but to walk through yours? And the Spirit of God continuing to make our hearts one together, as it says in Ephesians, so that the Spirit can dwell within our unity. We can dwell at our table, make a thin space of your home. I'm excited to be to chase after this together. We already have a few groups that are going, and it's an awesome movement happening. And our hope and our dream, our vision is that our church starts to look like the early church, that we gather and worship. We declare the goodness of God. We are missional. We go out all over to the ends of the earth. But this is a movement that started in their living rooms for them, and I believe it wants to start that, that, that way here too. We're invited to see all of the beauty of the kingdom in our homes. Over the next couple of weeks, we'll talk more about this, show more invitations, how you can get involved. If you're already in a home group, come on, fam. Thank you. It's about to go down. If you're interested, if, if, if you're curious, lean into that. We're going somewhere. God's making a thin space out of our houses. It's going to be a beautiful, beautiful thing. And on the off chance that you think, yeah, maybe not me, maybe not my house. I'm dealing with brokenness. I'm, dealing with, I'm struggling. My family is not perfect or put together. My kids are weird. We have our shoes off. We, we meet with our feet out. I won't come over, but other people will, I promise. Here, I want you to see. This chapter is powerful because Paul is calling a people to not just gather together, but to be a church. The people that meet here in Acts chapter 16 eventually become the church of Philippi, which is where he writes the epistle to the Philippians. And what the beautiful invitation we see is that Paul started a church out of a businesswoman, a demon-possessed girl and a suicidal parole officer. Not the winning candidates you would think he would select, but the reality of who they were, the trueness of their stories, good, bad, the ugly in between. That's what God moves in. The reality of our space, not a picture-perfect version of our space, the reality of our space. Heaven approaches. Heaven invites. There's a poem I'd love to read for you guys, not one of mine. It's Elizabeth Barrett Browning. She says, earth is crammed with heaven and every common bush a fire with God. But only he who sees takes off his shoes. The rest sit around and pluck blackberries. That earth is crammed with heaven. Heaven wants to enter into our cities, our conversations, our relationships, our communities, our prisons, our workplaces, our market, the roads. He wants to move and change things horizontally. We have to have eyes to see. Our prayer is that God will continue to mess with your theology. 
continue to mess with the folks that sit around your dinner table, that you would long for those that are not there. Our prayer is that the Spirit of God would land himself, not just in our church, but in our houses, to create a thin space, to do work for heaven and earth to do business. Because when that happens, friends, we can see nothing but revival, nothing but awakening, nothing but heaven occupying this space. So Holy Spirit, we pray, come. Fill us. Fill our church, God. Fill our worship. Fill our song. Meet us in your word. Meet us in our mission. Meet us in our generosity. Holy Spirit, do not pass by our homes. We are in desperate need of revival, of awakening, of a move, Jesus. We believe it comes. And before it knocks on legislation, before it knocks on the door of the public, before it moves in the city, the country, the continent, it comes to our houses, God. So will we be a people of open doors, of extended arms, and an invitation that says, come, Holy Spirit, work at my dinner table, work on my favorite chair. We'll cut the TV off for a while. We'll have conversation. We'll get it wrong. We'll bring our brokenness and our ugliness. We'll make mistakes. But would you blow like a rushing wind? in our hearts, in our homes. We love you. We pray. Amen.